Welcome to Burnside at Home for Sunday the 25th of September. Uh, this is a shortened pre-recorded version of the service that will take place in Burnside on the 25th of September at 11am. Do remember you're very welcome uh, to come along and to join us and you can listen to the whole service live or later on catch up on our website. Today we begin with an important message from Jesus Christ. He is revealing himself to us through the book of Revelation and he tells us what he is doing right now. And he wants us and what also he wants us to do right now. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. So today, as we continue through the book of Revelation, we find Jesus revealing himself to us. And today he is revealing the church. And we're going to look at the letters to the seven churches that are contained in chapters two and three. So let's begin with a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, today we give you thanks for your word and we give you thanks for your church. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us as your followers to be part of the church here on earth. And we pray, Lord, that we might live as members of that church, as parts of your body here, working together so that others may come to know of your love and experience your wonderful grace and mercy. Lord, we give you thanks for your church. We thank you that you have chosen us to be part of it. And we pray, Lord, that your church might be a light in this world, that we might shine brightly for others to come and find out who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you have not abandoned your church, but that you continue to move among the lampstands. And we praise you for your presence and we praise you for your help. So, Lord God, we give you thanks this day and we turn to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we're going to read from Revelation 2 and 3. We're going to cover over the next week on the Beside the Burn blog all the seven letters to the seven churches. Uh, Today we're just going to read two of them, but we are going to refer to the others as well. We're going to read the first letter and the last letter of the seven. So Revelation 2 verses 1 to 7 and then we skip to chapter 3 verse 14. And first of all, we begin with uh, the church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favour. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And in the church in Laodicea, chapter 3, verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. 
I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me in my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. And we pray that God will bless this reading of his word and that we might be blessed as we hear it and take it to heart. What is the most important organisation here on earth? Over the last couple of weeks, we have witnessed a British monarchy on the world stage. And although the influence of the monarchy may have diminished in recent years, the impact of the Queen's death was felt worldwide. So is the most important organisation the British monarchy? We might argue that the government of the United States of America now has global influence that Great Britain once had, or we might be looking at China as it increases on the world stage. But what is the most important organisation? We might be able to make a case for global banks, and we saw a few years ago the impact that the banking crisis had on the world, or even we might make a case for a social media giant like Facebook or Twitter. But today, in this revelation of Jesus Christ, we are told quite clearly what the most important organisation here on earth is. It is the church. The church is the body of Jesus Christ. The church is the only organisation left behind by Jesus. The church is the only organisation that Jesus calls us to be part of. The church is the way that Jesus has chosen to act in the world today. And it is the church that we are introduced to in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. It is the church that is revealed to us. We're introduced to seven specific churches, but this book is not limited to just those seven churches. The revelation of Jesus is for the whole church worldwide. Number seven is very, very important in this revealing of Jesus. Seven is the number of completeness. Seven is the number of perfection. So any time that we see seven mentioned, it may well refer to a specific number of things, but it always points us to completeness and perfection. So seven churches refers to seven individual churches that you could have gone to visit at that time. Indeed, the seven individual letters were delivered to these churches. But seven also refers to the complete church on earth. So everyone is allowed to read the seven churches, even though they're addressed to a specific church, we can read them all because they apply to all the churches right across the earth. So like the first readers of this revealing of Jesus, we get to hear what Jesus says to the other churches and we get to see how those letters therefore refer to us. Chapters 2 and 3 deal with what is happening on the earth at the moment and indeed the rest of the book of Revelation deals with what is happening in heaven at the moment. The revealing covers this time from the moment that Jesus ascended into heaven until the time that he comes back again. So we need not fear because Jesus is among the lampstands 
and he has promised that he is coming back again. We're to shine brightly for him so that others can come to know him. So let's look together at these letters. And there's a very reassuring message that Jesus gives to each of the seven churches. We only read two of the seven letters earlier, but if you were to look down through them now in your Bible, you will see that each one begins in the same way. Jesus says to the seven churches, I know. Every single letter begins with this phrase, I know. Now, what do we take from that? Well, Jesus is not wasting his time among the lampstands. We're told that that's where we can find him. Right now, he is moving among the lampstands. The lampstands are the church. He is watching. He is looking. He notices and he knows. He knows when we are living our lives well. For example, to the church in Thyatira, he encourages them by saying in chapter 2, verse 19, I know your deeds your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Jesus knows. He knows when we've messed up, whenever we've gone the wrong way, because to Laodicea, he says in chapter 3, verse 15, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either one or the other. He also knows the specific circumstances that we are living in today. To Pergamum, he writes, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, nor even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Jesus knows. He knows because he is with us. He's not a faraway God who has to wait for information to reach him. He knows he is among us. He is standing among the lampstands. He cares. He may have ascended into heaven. He may be seated at his Father's side, but his Holy Spirit is with us. So Jesus knows. Jesus is here in his church and that is why church is so important. This is how we meet God. So when we're tempted to give up, don't believe Satan who tells us Jesus doesn't care about us. Don't believe Satan when he says Jesus doesn't even know who you are. That is a blatant lie because here in this book, Jesus reveals to us that he knows. Now, does that not sound astonishing to you today? That Jesus would know our names, let alone know all the details about us. Listen to his voice today as he speaks to his church. I know. Wonder, have you ever considered then what the greatest threat to the church is? We may assume from a quick glance at Revelation that the greatest threat to the church must be persecution. After all, this is what was happening to the early church. They were being persecuted for their faith. But the strange thing about persecution is that often the church thrives in times of persecution. In countries where believers are under threat for their faith, where they are living under constant fear of imprisonment or death, The church grows. It grows in numbers and it grows in depth. So persecution is a threat to the individual members of the church, but through it, the church often grows. What Jesus reveals to us here is that Satan has three main strategies for attacking the church. Now, it would seem that he takes the most delight in persecution. This seems to be his preferred form of action. He seems to get most satisfaction from persecuting the church. But he also employs two other strategies, that of deception 
and seduction. And this is what we see from these seven churches. Satan tries to seduce some of them away from Jesus. The church in Ephesus is accused of abandoning their first love. He says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You see, Satan has seduced them away from Jesus. Jesus was their first love, the one that they first trusted in. But now their first love is something else. What has Satan used to seduce us? Or is Jesus still your first love? Is Jesus the one that we truly live for? Is he our first thought and desire? The church in Laodicea is accused of being lukewarm. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realise that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. Satan has deceived them into thinking that Jesus isn't as important as he should be. We should be burning bright for Jesus. And yet that light has now been dampened and apathy is what characterises them. They don't dislike Jesus, but they certainly don't love him. And Satan uses this sort of deception and seduction to destroy the church. If you find a church where people are lukewarm, Satan is at work destroying that church from the inside. If you find a church that has started to love something else more than Jesus, Satan is at work destroying that church. Sardis is accused of being dead, even though most people think it's alive. Thyatara tolerates Jezebel, a woman who should have no part within the church. Pergamum has this has accepted teaching that is not from the Bible. Perhaps they thought God's word was too harsh, so they've watered it down. Satan will persecute. He will seduce and he will deceive if he thinks he can destroy the church of Jesus Christ. And this is the warning to us today. Do not be seduced or deceived by Satan. So what does Jesus want from his church? It is what John has already told us he is doing. Jesus wants us to patiently endure. He has very specific instructions for his church. The church in Ephesus, he says, consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Smyrna is told not to fear and to be faithful. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victors cry. Pergamum also was told to repent. Repent therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Thyatara is told to hold on to the truth until Jesus returns. Sardis is told to repent. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Philadelphia is told to patiently endure since you have kept my command to endure patiently. Laodicea is told to repent and welcome Jesus into their lives. As we look at these seven churches, what is it that we need to do today? What is God writing to us? Do we need to repent? Remember our first love? 
patiently endure. Jesus is revealing himself to us in the hope that we will see him and turn to him. If we keep the sin in our lives, then it will obscure our view of Jesus. So we need to repent as we patiently endure. As Jesus walks among the lampstands, this is his message to us. So the church is God's plan for mankind. The church is the only organisation that Jesus left on this earth. So it is the one organisation that we need to give our allegiance to, that we need to put our time and effort into. It is the one organisation that will bring good news to this world. Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, was asked just before the Queen's funeral if her faith and her belief in the resurrection should bring comfort to the nation. And the Archbishop said, the Queen's faith should bring hope to the nation. Hope of a world to come, hope of a resurrection, hope in a saviour. This is why Jesus has given us the church and he reveals himself to us. He chooses to do it through the church. And so today we have hope because Jesus is among the lampstands and he will not forsake us and he will not leave us. And therefore we need to recapture our first love. We need to repent of our sin. And we need to have the hope of Jesus in our hearts. Let's pray together. Lord God, we give you thanks for this revealing of your church today. As we see what it is to be part of your church and to live for your church each day, we pray that you would help us. And we pray, Lord, that we would know clearly what you're doing. Help us, Lord, to trust you. Help us to live for you. Help us to follow you each day. For we ask all of this now in and through Jesus' precious name. Amen.